Hello, everybody, and welcome to Thursday. This is our third week of the XAPI cohort, and I am pretty excited to be joining you. Uh, I look outside my window. I've got about six inches of snow. Maybe it's been a little bit dramatic here, um, but here indoors it is safe it is warm and we are ready to learn something about xapi together today um, i'm actually really excited for today's session as well as some of the follow-up uh, materials that we're going to share with you this week so welcome to xapi cohort so i am going to just click a few buttons and hopefully with the magic of the internet you can all see my slides and we can be ready to rock and roll. Thank you for the thumbs up. And thank you for any of the emojis. They really help actually, I love the emojis in AirMeet because um, it really helps uh, connect connect with, with people when we can't see you, right? Um, so welcome to XAPI Cohort. If this is your first time here, just know it is never too late to join. Um, we have 757 people um, registered for XAPI Cohort this spring already. Um, please invite your colleagues and your friends. I'm a firm believer of learning together uh, with your team. I'm also a firm believer of building your professional network by encouraging others to take advantage of great opportunities and we'd like to think that this is one of them this is week three of 12 weeks of fun um, i am megan torrance jimmy washington is producing today um, matt cleaver is ever present in the slack and helping uh folks out and the xapi gnome is the twitter handle that has all of the useful information um, and uh has has an opportunity for you again to share that with your network um, we also post on linkedin this week at cohort i'm super excited uh to invite back to the cohort stage uh peter gunther um who has been one of the xapi cohort hosts in the past and today he's going to share with us how to send xapi data from something that is not e-learning right e-learning is where we kind of gravitate to because we've got those tools and we already know how to use them and we know there's data that we want from them and that's not the only game in town. It's a great place to get started. It's not the only game in town. And so Peter's going to share with us some uh, some cool stuff that you can do there. Uh, um, what is the XAPI cohort? So here's the thing. Since it's never too late to join cohort, we have new people all the time. So we're just going to go back over a few basics. If you've been here for all session long, no worries. If you've been here for multiple cohorts, just hang tight. You already know this stuff. Um, we'll get to uh, we'll get to the, the, the meet in a moment. Um, so XAPI Learning Cohort is a free virtual vendor neutral, but vendor supported 12 week learning by doing project based team learning experience and community. It's got almost all of the learning buzzwords you could possibly imagine in one paragraph. Um, Cohort, we have weekly web sessions and we have project teams. So this is the weekly web session. Welcome. Uh, um, project teams, we're going to talk about those a lot today. So hang tight there. And then uh, we follow up with a weekly email with updates and recordings if you can't make it live or can't stay all the way through today. So these weekly web sessions, we have a curriculum and it's orderly. So today we have Peter Gunther. We're still in the what is XAPI and how do I actually do it? Part of the arc of the curriculum here. Um, and then in our project teams, and we're going to see this a little bit later on today. This is the time when people are generating ideas and forming teams. And if you go out to that Slack community, it is exactly what is happening out there right now. So as you consider getting involved with cohort, you can engage as much as or as little as you can. So we have full on project mode. These people are in there, they are making stuff. When they are done with cohort, they will be able to walk away with a thing that they helped create and they got help creating. It's even better, right? Um, and, and, and that's pretty exciting. Uh, there's observer mode. 
you're not really actively working on a project, but you are more than welcome to connect with what's going on in Slack and ask questions and just watch from the side. You are all for that. And then there's just listening in or lurking, right? Um, you're here for web sessions, you're getting the emails, low commitment mode. That is totally cool. You know, we actually have several people, lots of people, more than several, who are in listening in or lurking mode um, for one or more cohorts. And then they find they have the time, they have the need, they have the project, and they jump all in. You don't have to wait. You can more than welcome to jump all in first, but um, that this is an absolutely okay thing. It is all right if you are too busy to get engaged. So for those of you who are in a little bit more, right? Um, and generally, if you're here, you're all in a little more. <laughs> so if you have questions about XAPI itself, the beautiful thing is that the community itself answers these questions. Drop them right out there in the Slack channel um, and, and, and go for it. When you register for cohort, you get an invitation to this very powerful Slack community. It is full of beginners experienced folks and including people who created the specification itself. It's pretty awesome. Um, if you have questions about the mechanics of cohort itself, go ahead and find me or Jamie or Matt Cleaver um, in Slack, or you can email us at XAPI cohort at torrentzoning.com. And one of us will, will triage that one of us will get your, um, your answers to your questions. Um, I would like to invite uh, Peter Gunther to the stage right now, and I am going to relinquish my screen sharing and let Peter spend some time and feel free to ask your questions in the chat, but talking about um, how we get data, right? Last week was how we get data from e-learning courses, right? This week, it's how do we get data from something that's not an e-learning course? So I am going to stop sharing my screen. Peter, welcome. And it's good to oh, see you, my friend. Good to see you again, Megan. Thanks for having me here. Um, okay, and now I do have a present button. So let me just get the slides up. And Megan or somebody with an emoji, can you let me know you're seeing uh, my slides rather than Megan's now? We got your slides. All right. Emojis. So um, you know, here we are. Uh, I have a couple of co-presenters today. I'm just going to warn you that uh, my cat Preston just turned 18 on Monday, and he has a lot to say. Uh, he does not like it if I'm speaking and not petting him. So we will probably hear from him. Uh, he got quiet when uh, Megan and Jamie and I were backstage. He was uh, he was quite uh, talkative. And uh, the XAPI has come over for Megan's office to give me a hand. XAPI gnome to give me a hand. With this presentation as well. So uh, let me hide this notification and let me get started. A few quick things about me. Who am I? Why am I here? Uh, I am now a data engineer at Watershed. Uh, I work less on the hardcore data stuff, ETL and cleaning pipelines, uh, and more on XAPI and uh, a certain amount of consulting with you know, businesses about you know, what can they get from their data? What do they want to know about and do with that information? Uh, I'll talk more about Watershed in a slide or two. Uh, as Megan mentioned, I'm also a former co co former host of the XAPI cohort. Uh, I was at Torrance Lot Learning in 2018, 2019, and uh, I had the joy of hosting two uh, cohorts. Uh, my background, uh, for the most part, is in teaching. Uh, I do have a master's degree in instructional design. Um, I, do, I did teach uh, programming and business applications, and CAD and web design, a whole lot of other stuff for almost two decades uh, in high schools before moving on to become a boot camp instructor and starting adults on their software development um, journey. And uh, now I'm a data engineer. So pretty much my whole career, I have worked with learning. I've, I've worked with learning data. Uh, and about five years ago, XAPI became a big part of that for me. New this year, I'm also a master's student in game design at Michigan State University. So going back to school and uh, very interested in analytics, very interested in serious games and learning games. 
Uh, and overall, I'm a self-taught tinkerer. Um, I don't have a, a big formal background in computer science or anything. Uh, most of what I've learned, I've learned on my own, um, XAPI included. Uh, and I'm a little peripatetic. So I've got uh, a lot of different examples. I've got, you know, fingers in a lot of different pies. And so uh, I want a part of what I want to do here is just throw a bunch of things out here and get the creative juices flowing, get you thinking about what could you do with an XAPI cohort project. Just a little bit about Watershed. Watershed is a learning record, record store. It stores XAPI data first and foremost. It is what we call a learning analytics platform. So it will help you do more with that data and it will tie in other non-XAPI data as well, HR data uh, and data from other systems that we can turn into XAPI. If you're interested in using it for your learning record store for your project, we do have an offer for cohort participants. I posted that a couple weeks ago in the Discuss Demos and Vendor Offers channel, and you can find it there. So uh, Megan introduced me as speaking about sending XAPI from things that aren't e-learning. Um, can you go ahead in the chat? Why don't you throw out a few ideas? What do you think I'm going to talk about or what are you hoping I'm going to talk about today? What? Would you want to send XAPI from that's not uh, e-learning? IoT, cool. Websites, yep. Mobile devices are going, going too fast for me. Yep, CRM. Uh, library, hmm. Uh, persona tracking, videos, uh, documentation, PDFs. Yeah, great. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of the stuff you're talking about I'm going to touch on today. Um, some of these things I'm not. Some of these things I'd have some questions back for you. Um, but uh, yeah, if I'm not talking about the thing you're thinking of, uh, it doesn't mean it's not possible. A lot of it's going to be parallel. So quick outline for my 20-ish minutes today. I, I want to give a survey of a bunch of different things and what the XAPI you send from them might look like. Going to be very high level, going to be pretty quick. Uh, but again, just to spur those creative juices. And then I'm going to dive in and give you a little more detail. I will show you sending XAPI from a web page and a little bit of code, uh, because that is, of course, one way you can send XAPI data, not the only way. Um, and, you know, questions throughout. So I will try to pause and catch up on chat questions a couple times during, and then we'll have some question time at the end. Uh, piano playing and speed uh, could be possible with a MIDI device. Interesting, Amy. Okay, so first part of my presentation, just some high-level use cases. First couple are things I, I worked on with uh, Matt and Megan and others at Torrance Learning. And so uh, one of those is an attendance roster. Yes, you can send in-person XAPI data. So whether it's an online course or an in-person course, you could have a web form uh, that the teacher or somebody else is responsible for filling out, and it's going to send XAPI data. Um, you could enter names manually, you could have people self sign in, or you could have a CSV, uh, a, a comma separated value file that you just upload and you check off these people are here, oh, this person's not here, remove them. What's that XAPI statement gonna look like? It's probably gonna have their name and their email, uh, if it's corporate learning, you might have, uh, rather than their email, you might identify them by an ID number. Uh, the verb, probably going to be attended. Uh, there are other options, but for uh, an attendance roster, that makes the most sense. For an object of the statement, you're going to have the class name and some kind of activity ID. And that's all that has to be in there. Uh, and I'm going to keep reinforcing these on several of these slides. You know, these are the parts of an XAPI statement that Megan talked about a couple weeks ago. Actor, verb, and object are the three you need. And so that could be enough. But context and result is where your data really gets power and gives you interesting information. Uh, and so the context for an attendance roster could be, what site is this at? What section number are they attending? Is this course part of a curriculum? Uh, who's the instructor? The XAPI spec has ways that you can include all that information. Um, my colleague, Peter, just 
uh, you know, reviewed our data from January and a lot of our XAPI statements, I think the average is around 15 uh, data points in a single XAPI statement. So where can you add value when you're sending XAPI? That's part of what I hope I'm, um, part of what I hope I'm sparking here. Uh, and then result, you could have the duration of the class. Uh, it becomes more than just a roster. If, you're if there's a post-test and you're including the score, uh, but that could also be possible. It's not e-learning, but it could be a, a form that supports one-year courses. The CMI profile um, is particularly for things launched from the LMS. Um, it's to it's to capture you know some of the the SCORM information, some some other information. I would not use uh, the CMI profile here, um, but yes, the CMI profile. These are all add-ons. The CMI profile will have some of that context information and you can always add it on. David, thanks for that question. Another non-e-learning source that you might think of is surveys. Uh, I know the process is a little different now with GitHub, but uh, once upon a time with the XAPI cohort, we used to have a weekly check-in survey from each team. The web-based survey was a company formerly known as Survey Gizmo. Uh, now it's Alchemer, um, but this is an actual uh, screenshot of the old form. And so this information can be turned into XAPI. The reason we use Survey Gizmo, now Alchemer, is because they had an XAPI integration. We get stuff straight into our LRS. And so again, here you're going to have people fill out a name and email. That's going to identify your actor. People are coming from different companies. They don't have a single ID number. Email is that unique identifier. Here you're going to send multiple statements. And so for each item, there's going to be an answered statement. So Peter Gunther answered, what's your name? ID number for that. And then actually, what is uh, the response? Uh, and I've got a mistake here on the slide, actually, uh, because actually the result is going to hold the response. Um, so we might not send an, uh, a statement for name because that's in all the other statements. But for question number four there, what work did the team complete? That answer is going to go into the result. Uh, context could include, you know, what survey does this question belong to? Um, potentially you could make it so the team became a context point as well and not just a specific uh, answer, but context for all the other answers, okay? And then there's a final XAPI statement being sent that this survey was completed, that all these questions belong to. Little different is performance checklists. Oftentimes we want to know, is our training, is our learning making a difference? Are people able to apply this on the job? And one of the ways you can do that is by measuring performance. The example I thought of here on the right side is changing a car tire, something I could easily come up with uh, or crib from a website down below, uh, come up with a checklist for, but you can identify, did this learner do these things? Did they skip something? Did they forget to place the wheel wedges? I've never placed a wheel wedge in my life. Uh, I don't own any and I've managed to change a car tire. So having that skipped is a meaningful piece of information. Uh, remove hubcap. You know, what if I uh, forgot to do that? What if I damaged the hubcap in the process? That could go into my rating and my comments. And so again, actual time of performance, we could have XAPI generated by an observer. And so uh, like the other, like the survey, there might be multiple XAPI statements, one for each area they're being rated on, one overall. Uh, the actor is going to be, again, name and email, name and ID number. The verb is going to vary. There's going to be an object for each, this item one, this item two, this whole survey. And then who's doing the evaluation? That's going to go in the context so that we have a way of sorting our XAPI, of slicing it, of pulling out information in the future about are we seeing a difference between this evaluator and other evaluators? So it's really important to think through what information do I want to store? How can I capture as much as possible that's relevant and meaningful? It could also include relevant competencies. Um, 
car tire, probably not the best example for this. Uh, but if they're, you know, if a uh, nurse is intubating a patient, there might be specific competencies around that. And so some of the checklist items have that as context, other checklist items, different context. Uh, and then the overall statement could include a result, success or failure. Uh, definitely duration, how long did it take them to complete the process, uh, and a score. If you're interested in this, a great off-the-shelf application. I don't know if they've got a, uh, an, a cohort offer uh, now, um, but uh, you can look for that, is Zappy Apps. XAPI dash apps. We allow them to say Zappy, even though other apps make us cringe when they do that. But um, Zappy Apps is great at creating these checklists. Uh, and I think Rebecca talked about that a little bit. Okay, let me catch up on a couple of questions. So, uh, yep, Zappy Apps. Okay, Megan uh, preceded me. Thank you for that. Calculate the total rating be done on the web page and send as XAPI. Uh, depends, Martin, depends on, on how you're sending it. Um, if you're using Zappy apps or another app for your checklist, it might have one way of doing it. Um, the LRS doesn't do calculations. That's not the LRS's job. It's not part of the spec. There are LRSs that have tools on top of the core functionality of a learning record store. And that can include what we call at Watershed, we call aggregations. And so we could get some totals, we get some averages and so forth. So some of these platforms uh, provide additional features, um, but generally you're not going to calculate on the LRS. I would lean towards, if you have a, an overall completed statement, calculate the score on what we call the client side on the app or the web page and send that in the overall statement rather than putting that on the learning record store. Um, car tire, specific torque sequence and limits on applied torque. Um, if, you know, this, this is, you know, Brian, this is probably more uh, getting a teenage driver ready to change a car tire rather than a service mechanic, the type of people you're more used to uh, training, perhaps at Ford Motor. Um, but you're right. If I were training a mechanic, uh, this would be a very different checklist. This is a, this is like a personal safety. How do you change your own tire uh, where they're not going to be able to measure torque and so forth. But yeah, if you were training mechanics and you were the observer completing this performance checklist, absolutely. Uh, and that would go into, um, you know, context or it could go into the calculation of result. Did they succeed in this step or did they fail because they did the lug nuts in the wrong order? Did they, um, did they apply the wrong? I, I had that happen to me. Uh, I had a new tire put on. They didn't do it right. It went flat and the nuts were over torqued and one was cross threaded and I could not get that tire off on my own. So absolutely, Brian, I hear you that a performance checklist for mechanic training is going to have a lot of detail and XAPI provides the way that you can store all that information. So good points. I saw several people mention CRMs uh, when I asked early on uh, and uh, that would include Salesforce. There's lots of different software platforms that you could tie into XAPI. Um, and it's going to work the same, more or less, whether it's Salesforce, whether it's a wiki like uh, Confluence, um, potentially even a software development tool like Jenkins or Git. Uh, as well as planning management communication software, stuff like, you know, Monday.com, Slack. Um, and so there's lots of great data we can pull in. And what's more interesting is we can then look at that data uh, and how does our training relate to it? Does our training get a person, you know, more accurate with Jenkins? They have more successful build, builds. Does our sales training result in more closed deals as we're getting that data from Salesforce. Lots of great possibilities there. Uh, here's a quick uh, screenshot. Matt Cleaver gave this to me this morning. Um, the XAPI cohort Slack has an integration and the, these graphs are coming from, I believe you said it was a Yet Analytics learning record store. Um, but all of those, you know, when you post a public message, any channel on Slack, in uh, the XAPI cohort, it's going there. And so we can see this ebb and flow of, hey, it's the start of another cohort. Hey, it's the start of another cohort. 
you know, those groups, uh, you know, forming, norming, and storming, you know, you can see that from the data. This is the actual Slack activity. You know, what are the verbs? That's going to tell you something about how you planned it, as well as what are people doing. Um, who are the most engaged actors? Uh, I can't actually read uh, in that screenshot. I don't think my name is there anymore. Uh, once upon a time, it was. I'm guessing Jamie's name, Megan's name, are going to be pretty high up. Um, you know, 2,400 people uh, have done something in the cohort Slack since it started. Um, and then, you know, what are, what are the hot spots? When are people doing more day and time? At one point, I remember we also had a graph of, um, of like a network analysis and like who's connected to or who's uh, corresponding with replying to whom. That's all information you can get out of your platform through X API if you put the thought in, put the design in, and you're planning your statements well. All right. I'm going to hit these next few slides uh, super quickly. I do want to make one other point on that last one, which is a lot of these things are going to involve um, Zapier, which is a tool that can let you hook into lots of different applications. For example, with Salesforce, you know, Zapier could get fired off by, um, you know, whenever you send an outbound message. Uh, whenever you update a field, whenever you add a lead to a campaign and so forth. And so Zapier would hook into your Salesforce. On the other end, it's going to hook into XAPI. So if you're wondering, how do you get XAPI out of Salesforce? Zapier is going to be that, uh, that connector for you. And I believe that uh, Matt is going to provide a video of an example of how you can fire off uh, XAPI through Zapier. That should be coming out tomorrow. But jumping back into the slideshow, saw several people mention Internet of Things. Uh, these are perhaps a little more frivolous examples, but again, they might spark your thinking about what, uh, what else you can do with XAPI. And so at Torrance Learning, uh, the physical location in Chelsea, Michigan, there is a conference room where Matt Cleaver hooked up uh, a, a read switch. And so, you know, there's a little Arduino based, little, you know, chip uh, based microprocessor. Uh, is watching that switch. And whenever the door opens or closes, it sends an XAPI statement. It doesn't know who opened or closed the door. You know, they're not badging in. That could be a later step, certainly possible. But, uh, and that's the picture at the bottom, uh, is uh, statements, you know, they have an anonymous actor, Torrance Learning Team, open the door, close the door, open the door, close the door. Uh, you can see a little bit there of the context. You can see these got a temperature sensor. And so they're reporting, you know, what is the temperature? Uh, looks like that was a pretty warm day um, back when those were recorded. Another example, this little robot car in the top right is, uh, it was a kit that, that I added onto. Uh, and it's actually remote drivable. You can drive it off a, a web page on a tablet or whatever. Um, and it is sending XAPI statements about what you do. We did this uh, in, I already had the car together, uh, but we added the XAPI to it in a day at an XAPI party uh, a couple of years ago, 2019. Um, so we had a little hands-on thing and people could come in. We kind of planned out, what are the statements? What do we need? There's no XAPI profile for how you handle robot car driving. What do we want? Uh, and we came up with that and we, you know, sent a bunch of statements and we gave some of the attendees a driving test uh, that was measured or recorded with XAPI. There's an article on that on my last slide. You can read up about that. But again, you know, we've got these cheap, you know, the Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, these cheap devices now that can do an awful lot and can be embedded in daily life. So I guess I should back up and identify what do I mean when I say Internet of Things? That's what I mean. All right, let me catch up on any scrolled off messages. Um, conference rooms are always hot. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it is. Um, okay, a couple other ideas that I've been uh, working on to a greater or lesser extent. I talked at the last XAPI party about a, a kickboxing trainer. Uh, it exists in, uh, in uh, documentation only so far, but you could have sensors and you can measure things like, you know, what is people's reaction time? Are they hitting the right target? Um, are they hitting some targets better than others? 
Uh, how does that change over the course of a workout? A lot of interesting data you could gather there. Uh, newer one I started working on over the uh, holiday break is uh, my old exercise bike. Um, the 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 uh, the control pad went bad. Uh, the battery leaked and it was trash. Uh, and a Peloton is an expensive device, but hey, you know, I've got a bunch of stuff sitting around. Uh, so I was able to actually, you know, figure out pretty simply, how do you measure, you know, the cadence? It doesn't have a lot of fancy sensors. I'm not getting power, but at least I know how fast I'm pedaling. Uh, and I started building a, a game around that that displays on the screen. And then uh, you've just got uh, touch sensors, uh, those ugly pieces of aluminum foil. Uh, and I'm not at the XAPI phase with it yet, but it could. It could measure you know, how long did he bike? What was the intensity? When did he slow down? When did he speed up? Uh, so XAPI, again, a vehicle for a lot of different performance in information as well as learning. I'm going to um, just, you've got the slides here. There are some uh, relevant links. Uh, this GBL XAPI profile uh, is super handy if the Unreal team, uh, for instance, wants to go ahead and uh, create a game or something game-like and send XAPI. Definitely something to look for. Um, this is actually some cohort data from uh, three different uh, three different project teams. Their, um, the, the game that I just showed is still up but their LRS is down right now. They had a server problem last week. But Stuart Claggett, former uh, participant, used to... Um, this is... Uh, um, two things, David. The, there's the profile in the library. The GBL XAPI library is for Unity, you're correct. However, as an XAPI profile, it's not tied to any specific platform. It's tied to what are the things people are doing in games. And so GBLX API, in terms of the vocabulary terms, the verbs, the objects, the context information is 100% applicable to, to Unreal. Good question. But the data you're seeing on the right side did come from Unity uh, a few times uh, a few times ago. I think Stuart said this was, uh, Stuart, who, who runs the company that made the GBLX API profile and hosted this for, I think, three different cohort teams uh, and this will look at data sent from their games and experiences. All right. And then augmented reality and virtual reality, a lot of, of information that we want to capture there, a lot of, of great stuff um, that's relevant to the things we do in L&D. But I want to move on to my last part. Uh, Megan, can I get a time check? Am I good for about five more minutes? Or Jamie or anybody? Yes, cool. Okay, this is high level. Um, first off, don't get scared. Uh, this is not addressed to everybody in attendance today. Megan uses the term geek free XAPI and I totally believe in it. There's a lot of tools out there that let you send XAPI without writing a bit of code. Uh, Alchemer being a great example, Zappy apps being a great example. Uh, Kaltura as a video platform, you know, and there's more and more every day. So there are lots of ways that you can send XAPI from non-e-learning sources without writing code. But a lot of times groups do want to send some statements of their own. And that's the people I'm talking to today. If you want to start sending XAPI from code, what do you do? First thing, you'll need a learning record store. I like Watershed but there are lots of them out there. Um, your learning record store is going to give you credentials, uh, an endpoint or a web address where the statements are going for. And then uh, what some sites call a key and a secret, others call a username and a password. Now this is sensitive information. I'm about to show you one set of credentials of mine because that's the one I'm gonna be working with. And right after this, I'm going into my LRS and I am deleting that set of credentials. Um, but I want you to see a real set so you understand you know, what's going on here. So here in my personal private watershed sandbox, which uh, you can sign up and get anybody even without the XAPI cohort offer, I have several different sets of endpoints the catapult test was uh, when I was working with the CMI5 team a little bit. Um, 
last cohort. Uh, so I had a separate set of credentials. So I knew what that came from. Postman is a, a tool that I skipped, uh, that I'm about to talk about briefly. Um, ADLX API Lab is a great tool. Just Google that phrase. Uh, maybe Matt can toss the link in, but um, that is a great tool where you can just create from a form. You can create a statement. You can test it against your learning record store. Um, so I created this XAPI cohort spring 2022. Now for Watershed, they all use the same endpoint. So this is going to be that first piece of information, my endpoint. I've got my key. I've got my secret. I could uh, change those. I could delete them. These other things are more specific to, to Watershed and are not, uh, not so much about XAPI, but they do have to do uh, with security and then some of our extra features. And Preston wants to be heard. Okay, so you've got your information. If you're using Zappy apps, if you're using Alchemer, you need that information for their tool. And you're going to put it in there. And then you may have, depending on the tool, you're gonna to have some options for configuring what you want, what you don't want. I'm focusing on the other side. If you're sending something of your own then, the first thing you're going to need is you're going to need a library. Uh, it is a web API. You could write your own code. For most languages, there's no reason to because these libraries exist. So Rust to see is Watershed's sister company uh, and, and the company out of which Watershed formed. Uh, and they have their own tin can libraries, the original name of the spec. And those exist for Objective-C, for uh, you know iOS stuff. Uh, Python, JavaScript, C Sharp. There's a bunch of them. Okay. Uh, newer kit on the block is xapi.js. I know Matt Cleaver is doing more work with that recently. Uh, and then longstanding, there's the ADL XAPI wrapper as well. So you've got some choices. Depending on your language, you'll have to decide. David, yes, the libraries are free to download JavaScript, C Sharp, any of the Rust C tin can. Uh, the ADL, I, th I think, only exists for JavaScript. It is also free. I don't know the details in xapi.js. Okay. As you're making those statements, Postman and Insomnia are tools that hit APIs. They can be used for um, they can be used for XAPI as well. Uh, and so that's a good testing tool to make sure that you understand the structure of your statement. You know your data is getting through. Uh, I like to start with Postman to know you know all this is okay. So then if I'm having problems later, it has to do with my programming. I've talked about what you might want to send statements for. I've talked about some of these decisions about what you're going to use in terms of verb IDs, activity types, and activity IDs. But the planning phase is very, very important. Okay. So um, let me give you this. Uh, let me give you this. You can you can go ahead and uh, there's there's a couple buttons you can press. Everybody loves pressing buttons. Uh, but I'm actually going to switch over. I think I can show my code a little bit bigger uh, here in VS Code. Okay, so this is the code behind the page that I just linked. Okay, it is a web page. It has a form on it. Uh, let me show that first. So your name, your email, and a pair of buttons. So this code is simply getting those elements onto the page. Your name, your email, couple of buttons. Um, I am... Uh, there are a lot of things I'm doing old school or plain wrong in this page. Uh, I would not really build an app this way. So if you're judging me, don't judge me. Um, but I wanted just a real simple, clean example. Okay, so super simple. Uh, you click the button, you call send X API with button one. Okay, nice and clear there. You know, other ways are gonna uh, obfuscate that and break it into three different places. Okay, so what else do I have to do here? First thing I'm really doing script-wise is I am loading that tin can library, uh, supporting my friends over at Rust2C. 
uh, by using their, uh, their library. It's the one I'm most used to. Then I need to set up my information for my learning record store. And this is how this library does it. So I just plug in that endpoint, that username, that password that I got from inside my learning record store. And uh, just a little logging if there's a problem. Okay, and then we saw up above, if you click the button, it's gonna call SendX API. So this is what really happens. I send X API. I'm going to uh, find out what's in that name field. I'm going to check if it's valid. My check is super simple. Is it at least three letters? If it's not, I'm not even going to try to send the statement. I'm going to alert the user. Again, I wouldn't really do this in a web page, keeping it simple. Uh, I do the same thing with the email. So I grab it from the uh, field. I check if it's valid. This really needs to be more robust because if you try to send it without a proper email address, it will bounce back. The LRS will reject it. Feel free to try that out. Uh, you should see a warning pop up that your statement was not saved. Um, okay. Then I create the statement. So my actor has the name that you put in the full name field and has the email you put into the email field. I just have a verb hard-coded in here. Believe it or not, there is not a standard agreed upon XAPI verb for clicked. Uh, and so interacted is my best option here. Then what did they interact? What did they click on? Okay, I am building an ID. I have made up a base ID. Uh, I don't care that it came from my website. I, came, I care that it came as part of the XAPI cohort. Um, normally, I'm not going to make up an ID for a domain I don't control. I figured Megan would let me slide on this. Um, so I just created like, hey, okay, we've got, the, uh, um, we've got the cohort. It's this cohort. Uh, it is week three. And it is my XAPI example page. And then it is the specific button is going to get filled in button one or button two. As I think about this, I should have um, I should have uh, I should have added an extra level here, like activities or uh, objects, um, to really to really do this right. Uh, I can, if you're interested, I can give you a great link on uh, an article series on governance and how you decide some of the stuff. Okay, I looked at the vocab server and I decided that this is an interaction with this ID is the best fit. I named it, okay, so plain English readable name. It's the spring 2020 XAPI cohort week three, demo button one, demo button two, okay? And who can resist a button? So that is uh, that is it. The only stuff left, uh, sorry, okay, that is not it. Uh, kind of skip down here. This is just checking, is it at least three characters? Okay, so that builds the statement. Finally, I tell the LRS, that I set up at the beginning to go ahead and save the statement I just built. And then this, um, this fills in, uh, this handles whether it got through or not. So if it didn't get up, it's gonna tell me the statement failed, like if you used a bad email. And if it worked, it's gonna tell me the statement saved. Okay, super high level intro. Let's just see it in action. Peter Gunther, okay, peter.gunther at Watershed LRS, okay, uh, I'm going to hit button one. Now, save and saved. Now, what if I put in a bogus email? Statement failed. So like I said, you really do have to check those emails. There are other ways. You don't have to have an email. You could have an ID number. That statement's going to get sent a little differently. Uh, real quickly now, I'm just going to refresh. This is inside Watershed. This is my data search showing me my newest statements. And so uh, there is Peter Gunther, interacted with Spring 2020 XAPI cohort. Um, 
And uh, you can see other things get filled in by the learning record store. There's an ID, uh, there's an XAPI version, there's an authority. This corresponds to that set of credentials I used. There's the timestamp of when it happened and the timestamp of when it was stored. Everything else is the stuff that I spelled out in that statement. Who did it? What did they do? What did they do it to? Um, I will point out, oh, that's not the one I meant to show. Here's my bad. So it is recorded in the learning record store. There was an invalid statement. The inbox value is not a valid email. Okay, a lot of information. Uh, the good news is you've got a recording. If you want to go back over this, I will share the code as well um, so that you have it. Um, and I will start catching up on a few of these questions. Yeah, Keeper, David. Thank you so much. Um, and most of the questions got answered as they went along, but you might want to cruise yep. through the scrolling. Yeah, um, David. David, I share your concern about you know security. Uh, ideally, you are doing this more in the back end and keeping some of those credentials safe. Um, you know, the, I think there's a tin can uh, PHP. There's certainly C sharp. Uh, I don't know so much about tutorials. Um, Peter, I'll leave a. We've got some cohort yeah. business. I'm going to leave yeah. a few questions for you in the Slack or in cool. the not in Slack in the chat. Okay. I will, uh, I'll let you go then, and I will follow up on chat and Slack. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much. That was super cool. Lots of great examples and lots of details. So appreciate that. Um, and I hope everybody else did too. You can find Peter in the uh, cohort Slack also. Uh, and uh, so you've got lots of lots of opportunities to follow up with him. But um, uh, Peter, you've got some questions in the chat, so we are good to go. All right. So Peter mentioned free stuff, and so where I said that cohort is vendor neutral, cohort is also vendor supported, and free offers from vendors um, help make some of this a little bit easier. Uh, these are not necessarily exclusive to cohorts. So some of these uh, free offers are available otherwise. Um, but I uh, wanted to, to, to highlight a few things. These are also in the Slack. There is a demos and free offers um, Slack channel. So um, the when Peter started talking about the code, he said the first thing you'll need is an LRS. Um, lots of LRSs have free trials. Um, the, these four have been called out um, as having free trial offers. Um, and then um, what I don't have here is that Learning Locker also has a, um, uh, a free uh, one that you can download and install yourself. So um, lots and lots of good stuff from a, um, uh, an LRS perspective. You should not be um, lacking an LRS. There's also right, some resources from statement senders to learning opportunities for you. So um, I know a number of teams are working on storyline projects. Um, there is a free um, cohort uh, storyline uh, Zappoli, not storyline Zappoli, Zappoli account that you can um, sign up if you want to extend storylines um, out of the box statements. Um, believe that Rebecca's uh, demo last week showed some of that. Um, Zappy Apps was the one that we uh, that, that Peter mentioned uh, has great checklists and you can also grab Vimeos and YouTubes and PDFs and all sorts of things and assemble them into a package. Um, Pebble Pro, you can get a Pebble Pro free trial license and you can participate on the Pebble Pro project profile project. That's a lot of P's. Those are actually two very separate things. So um, you have the opportunity to do there. Clixi is an interactive video tool. Um, that's pretty cool. And then from a learning perspective, if you are interested in learning more about data science, like what do I do with all this data once I get it? Um, Quant Hub has um, offered us a, uh, a, free, uh, a free trial. So that's pretty awesome also. Um, 
A few of you mentioned, well, and so I'll pause there. Thank you, vendors. That's really, really awesome and very, very supportive. And Amy, yes, right? Swag for geeks. Um, so um, a few of you mentioned like, hey, I'd like to know a little bit more about what teams are forming. And teams are definitely forming. Um, next week, teams, I'll be hitting you up for status updates and how things are going. Right? So we covered this a little bit a couple weeks ago, right? Successful teams have an idea, right? Formed enough that people know what you're doing. You have a Slack channel and possibly a GitHub account, right? Where you can store your accounts. And then you have some way of communicating and it's absolutely in Slack, um, but generally there are meetings and um, synchronous versions uh, to get together. So um, if you are looking for your uh, Slack channels and your team channels, go ahead and click the browse channels in Slack, scroll down until you get team, right? That's why we have them prefixed this way. Um, and that way you can find the team. So let's take a little bit deeper look at what these teams are doing. I'm not going to read all of this. If you are intrigued, you can go take a look at their Slack channel. Or you can screenshot these screens as we go. But there is a team that's picking up from work that started last semester um, with a, a team CMI5. This was pretty cool. A uh, team that did a whole bunch of different um, kind of parallel projects and then shared out their results. Team former teachers, they're figuring out what kinds of projects they are going to take on. I'm actually really excited about what I see there. It's kind of a birds of a feather uh, affinity group, and they are figuring out the XAPI world, and that's pretty cool. Team Free Code Camp, uh, it's good to see Joan back at the cohort and kind of organizing and doing a little rabble rousing there uh, with uh, getting a group of, of folks to do some free code camp stuff. And I think that will be super fun. A few of you mentioned today, um, where can I learn more or what kinds of code should I be doing? And if those are the kinds of questions you've got, that might be a team for you. Team LTEM is working with Will Talheimer's learning transfer evaluation model, which is my favorite model for what kinds of data, like if I can collect all this data, what do I collect? And Will's model provides a lot of great questions for what could I collect? Um, so I'm super excited. Um, there's also an offer for that team uh, from Will Talheimer to come and speak to you. Um, and uh, so I think that's a, a pretty exciting opportunity there. Team more than SCORM, right? Um, at looking at things that you, they can kind of get around a SCORM package. So um, there's still SCORM. Did you know you can send SCORM and XAPI at the same time, which is also pretty awesome. Um, team personalized learning three different course development tools and building in adaptive design, right? Using XAPI. So very, very cool stuff. Team and non-traditional data sources. That's what the theme of today was, right? These things that are not e-learning, right? Um, how do we get data out of things that don't existing have a, um, uh, don't, don't already out of the box have uh, that kind of integration? Uh, Zara, you're looking to join a team that's building governance and best practice for XAPI content vendors. Oh, interesting. You might learn a fair amount from Team Pebble Pro Profile um, that is building a profile for um, Pebble Pro. Um, or you could start your own, uh, start, start a project team. Uh, there's Team Storyline Beginner, bring your own project. Um, that is a really interesting group. Um, last semester, they had multiple parallel projects going on at once, um, and the goal was to then share their insights um, back to each other. Um, that team is still trying to figure out where and what they're going to do this time. Here's the team Pebble Pro profile. Woo, I can say that. That's a lot of peace. Um, and um, looking at ways that um, they can build a, an XAPI data profile um, for a an, e an interactive ebook tool. Um, and then there's Team XAPI Learner Progress. 
basically looking to get as much data as possible out of a course or a program um, and uh, kind of starting from scratch. So I'm actually really excited about that team as well. So how do I form a team? How do I find a team? Where do I find a team? There are dozens and dozens and dozens of channels in that Slack, right? So we have them named so it's easier to figure out what it is that you are seeing, right? And how to find more as you're going. So if you are looking for an active team, it will look like this. Okay, so go ahead and search for them, right? Or scan, I actually browse for them. So um, uh, Zara, great question. Hold on to that question because the answer is yes, but I'll give you more details. Uh, um, there are several discussions, right? That are not projects that are making a, they're teams that are making a project. They are just talking about stuff. I don't hit up the discussion channels for project updates. And then there's all sorts of other really useful things going on. And so this is where you get that free stuff that I mentioned today. Um, this is where you get your resources and recordings. Okay. So, and if you are recruiting for your team, by all means, post in main, right? And point back to your team. Hey, everybody, this is what we're doing. Come join us over here. There's a little bit of salesmanship there. Once you have a team, you can request to join the cohort GitHub and store your files there. Just click the little lightning ball or lightning bolt there. You're good to go. And we'll get you hooked up. So it is never too late to join cohort. Right? Oh, thank you, Jamie. Previously a lightning bolt. Now it's a plus sign. Um, it is never too late to join cohort. Please invite people to sign up and have a good time with you. Right? Like we said, you don't have to work on a project, but you can. And the question was, will we get to demo our stuff? Actually, I am going to go back to let me get my mouse in the right place here. Um, I am going to go back and share with us um, a better screen. Hang on. Oh, where'd my mouse go? There we go. Um, I'm going to come back to this screen. Okay. In the last few weeks, there we go, um, of the cohort, we will have project team demos. Each demo will run somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes, depending on how many demos we get. So teams, be planning on having something it won't be perfect. I know it, <laughs> right? It'll be, you'll be working on it, right? Something to share here, right? Then there's the XAPI party and we are set, working on setting a date for that right now. The XAPI party is a free full day online conference. May have a live component, depends on how how things go, right? Um, but the XAPI party, Right, is an opportunity to have a longer demo, more learning sessions, a whole bunch of stuff. We had 12 learning sessions at the last XAPI party, two different tracks. It lasted all day. It was free. We had hundreds of people in. It was a load of fun. XAPI party is actually a conference, um, but we call it party because um, we like that kind of vibe. I will also say I am actively seeking other opportunities for you to get involved in sharing the results of your work so that you can kind of be an inspiration to other people about XAPI. Stay tuned for those, but be ready to, to do that if you are looking at kind of getting some airtime for yourself and what you're learning and the work that you're doing, we will have opportunities for you to do that. So everybody have a great rest of your week, a fantastic weekend. If you're in the way of the snowstorm here in the U.S., take care of yourself. Thank you very, very much, Pierre Gunther. Thank you, Jamie and Matt Cleaver. And have yourself a great week going and making some stuff. We will see you next week where we'll start talking about XAPI profiles and how to keep your data all organized.
which is really, really important. We touched on profiles a little bit today, um, and we're going to get the straight scoop from um, Brett Smith and Andy Johnson. All right. Go out there. Have fun making stuff, everybody.